Martin. Thank you for the great introduction and for the opportunity of sharing my work here with everyone. All the talks that I've heard have been amazing. So hopefully this is gonna be uh, something that you all will enjoy. So today I'm gonna be talking, as Nathan said, about the trainability and barren plateaus in quantum neural networks. Barren plateaus is a term that we've heard many speakers uh, just throwing about. And I'm gonna try to delve a little bit more deeper into, into this phenomenon. So first of all, I would like to give a big shout out to my collaborators, uh, the people that I've worked on, on Brian Plateaus and on the papers that I'm gonna be talking about here because you know, no person is an island and there's no way that I would be uh, presenting the work that I'm presenting here without some of the LANL postdocs like Patrick, Lukash, and Andrew, and postdocs like Tyler and Akira that is now in Alero Technologies. And of course, the biggest shout out is for the students that I've worked with, Kunal, Samsung, and Arthur. So let's talk about quantum neural networks in the NIST era. And of course, this is sort of the topic of the conference. So I'm gonna to try to go a little bit fast here because this is something that people have already talked about. So we all know that classical neural networks have had an enormous impact in, in almost every area of science currently. Uh, and everyone is using quant classical neural networks to solve problems in almost, uh, as I said, like every area that you can think of. And of course, now that we start to have those NIST devices or those near-term quantum devices, are, as we call them, there is a tremendous interest in developing those so-called quantum neural networks. And of course, here, the hope is that we will be able to harness the power of quantum computers to outperform classical computers on machine learning tasks. And of course, specifically, we hope that this, uh, that this is gonna come true for quantum data or data that is uh, inherently quantum in its nature. So the question is, what is a quantum neural network? This term that we've heard people throwing uh, for the past couple of days. So the simple generalization, uh, the simple definition is just a generalization of the computational model that are classical neural networks, but now they're based on the principle of quantum mechanics. And in practice, just like in the classical case, there is not a single realization of quantum neural networks that we might point to and say, this is a classical uh, quantum neural network. There's many, but of course, most of them share the same structure. And here I'm gonna go into this picture that of course, I think that you've all seen multiple times, but whenever we have an optimization task, usually what we're gonna have is a problem that we wanna solve. And for this problem, uh, we're usually going to have some training set that we're gonna be using to, to train our quantum neural network. We're gonna define a cost or a loss function that is gonna encode the solution to the problem in one of its optima. It can be a maxima or it can be a minima. And we're gonna to try to optimize this cost function and we're gonna have an ansatz for how the parameters in that quantum neural network are gonna be encoded. So essentially what we do here and how we use quantum computers is that we're gonna use a quantum computer for the task that is hard to do classically. So we're gonna take our data, in this case, it could be a quantum state, we're gonna send it through a parametrized quantum circuit, we're gonna perform some measurements, or we're gonna send it through more specifically a quantum neural network where each one of the nodes can be a qubit and the lines can be unitaries uh, applying operation between those qubits. And the results that we have from, from using the quantum computers to, to compute those, uh, those quantities that we cannot classically simulate, we're gonna build our cost or loss function. And here, of course, uh, we've been hearing about this, the, this landscape that gets formed that we have to optimize and we have to find the minima of. And we're gonna harness the power of classical computers and classical optimizers to try to find the minima out of all those sets of parameters of our loss function. And we get into this hybrid updating loop where each time that we use a quantum computer, we send the cost function values or perhaps the gradients to a classical computer until we converge to a solution. And here the output of the quantum neural network might be a quantum state. If we're doing, for instance, the variational quantum state eigensolver, it might be a probability distribution. It might be a bit string, like whenever we're trying to solve optimization problems in QAOA, it could be a gate sequence. Whenever we're trying to compile a unitary, Patrick Coles was speaking about this notion previously, or it could be an operator that we're trying to find. Uh, but in all cases, it's sort of the same structure. And of course, the, there are many architectures that we can that we can fit into this framework: parametrized circuits for variational algorithms, perceptron-based quantum neural networks, convolutional quantum neural networks, etc. And uh, I'm going to do a little bit of shameless plug in here, but we have a review on variational algorithms. Uh, it's just called variational quantum algorithms. So if you're interested in more specifically about what are the tasks, the sort of problems that you can solve with variational algorithms. I would point you in this direction. Now, that being said, uh, the title of my talk is Analyzing the Trainability. 
of quantum neural networks. And the question that I want to ask, and the question that I'm most interested in is, is why do we want to analyze the trainability of quantum neural networks? So here, the, you know, those who study history are not doomed to repeat it. So we know that classical neural networks, as much as they are used today, they saw great periods of stagnation when they were being developed. You know, with, they first started with the single perception, but then it was realized that you have to go to multi-layer perception because they were more powerful, but they were harder to train until the backpropagation methods were developed. And in between those big jumps in their development, there were like big periods of stagnations or winters as people got to call them. So the question that I'm interested in is, are we looking at a quantum neural network winter that is coming from some trainability issue of quantum neural network that we're not seeing? So in order to avoid just steering into a winter, I think that it becomes paramount to analyze the trainability in quantum neural networks so that we have some guarantees that we're gonna be able to train them and we're gonna be able to outperform classical neural networks. So how do we analyze the trainability of quantum neural networks in the context that I'm speaking, which is, are we able to train the parameters? That's what I mean by trainability. We just take our architecture and we can optimize. So each time that we go into this loop, we have a better value of our loss function. So as I was saying, parameters, what we need to do is in our quantum neural network, we have to train those parameters. They can be rotation angles, they can be perception weights, but in all cases, we need to optimize over that set of parameters. And as I already mentioned, we just define the cost or loss function to quantify how well this is performing. And each set of parameters leads to one cost function value, usually a real number. So we can map from this hyperparameter space of the parameters into quantum neural networks to the cost function landscape. And analyzing this landscape is going to give us information about whether we're able to detect the minima. Maybe we, get, we can say something about we're going to get stuck in a local minima, or we can say something about how flat the landscape is. And this is where Baron Plateaus come in. And before going into Baron Plateaus, I want to make a small mathematical uh, interlude about precision in quantum mechanics. And let me ask a very simple question, uh, which is, we all know that com quantum computers are probabilistic in nature. So given that statement, we have a one qubit state. It's a mixed state, someone gives this to you. How do we estimate the probability of this qubit being in the zero state? So of course, for a theorist like me, this, be, this is very simple. We just take your state and you just project it into the old zero state. And that's the probability of you measuring your qubit in the old zero state. But you know, unluckily, quantum computers are more complicated than this because we have to perform measurements. So if we have one qubit state in practice, what we have to do is we have to measure our qubit many, many times, in this case, n times. And we're going to see how many times our qubit appeared in the zero state. And we're going to estimate this probability as a frequency, as the frequency of times that our qubit appeared in the old zero state. And we know that given n shots, this is what we call shots, the number of shots that we call to the quantum computer, this statistical precision is going to be of the order 1 over square root of n. And why is this important? Why, why am I talking about this, this precision? It's because barren plateaus are a statement about, uh, about the landscape. And a non-mathematical definition of barren plateaus is that, in average, the cost function partial derivatives are going to become exponentially flat or suppressed with the system size. That means that they're going to become very close to being zero, and we're going to have to estimate them. Because whenever we're using a gradient descent algorithm, we need to compute the gradients to be able to determine the cost minimizing direction. And as we've heard multiple times, uh, in parameterized quantum circuits, we can use the parameter shift rule to compute the partial derivative with respect to one parameter as just the cost function defined in two different uh, with two different parameters, by right? doing plus and minus pi over two. So here, of course, the question is, uh, the cost function is usually estimating some probability. We have to estimate this cost function. So estimating the gradient is this has the same problem. We're going to have to perform measurements in my quantum computer to be able to estimate the gradient to be able to train, right? So in a barren plateau, what we're saying is that the partial derivative is of the order 1 over 2 to the n. This is what it means that it becomes exponentially flat with the system size, where this small case n is the number of qubits. So if we have four qubits and you're trying to train your quantum uh, neural network in a toy model with four qubits because you want to show that it's able that you're able to do it, you might say, all right, so 
the magnitude of, of my class function partial derivatives is going to be 0 0.06. And we need about 256 shots to be able to estimate this number due to this one over square root precision. So whenever you use whatever simulator you prefer, uh, you're going to set the number of shots. You're usually going to use way more shots than this. And you're going to be able to estimate the gradients and train. And you're going to be very happy because you can train your quantum neural network. But if you have a burn plateau, and now you're trying to train this architecture with, say, 20 qubits, now the order of this partial derivative, this should be a minus 7. Uh, I just realized that I did that there's a small typo here, so sorry about that. The magnitude of that cost function partial derivative is extremely small. And you're going to need a number of shots of 1.1 times 10 to the 12, or a trillion shots. A trillion sounds like the amount of money that Dr. Evil is, is requesting to not use his, his moon laser. So, you know, that is a big number of shots. So whenever you have a barren plateau, you're essentially not going to be able to expend that many shots to estimate your cost function partial derivatives. And you're not going to have an accurate estimate of what direction you should be working at. So what happens? If we have a cost function landscape, like this beautiful New Mexico landscape right here, and now we think about inverting the cost function landscape so that we want to reach the maximum. If we don't have a barren plateau, what's going to happen is that we're going to randomly initialize somewhere in the landscape. We're going to estimate the gradient because we don't require an exponentially large number of shots. We just set a number, which is usually going to be enough. We're going to determine a cost minimizing direction. And hopefully, we're going to be able to converge to the optima of our problem. Uh, if we have a barren plateau, the, now it's very different because we're going to randomly initialize. And whenever we try to estimate our gradients, because we don't have this trillion shots we're just going to have statistical noise. So essentially, whenever we have this estimate of saying, oh, my gradient is such value, this is not the actual gradient. It's just the statistical noise that we have because we don't have enough, short, enough shots. So our gradient descent or our optimization method is going to end up being a random one, and we're not going to be able to optimize our algorithms. So this is just to say barren plateaus is, are important because they talk about the scalability of your quantum neural networks. You're not, you might not be able to see them at small problem sizes, but whenever you go to larger problem sizes, you might not be able to train your algorithm. So of course, just again, I throw this to the mean competition for QHack. You have your hopes of achieving quantum advantage. You train your quantum neural network. You're very happy about this, but you have barren plateaus and you didn't realize that you had barren plateaus. So, so then of course the question is, how do we know if we have barren plateaus in our architectures? So the first paper that analyzed barren plateaus in quantum neural networks was this beautiful and seminal paper by the Google group called Barren Plateaus in Quantum Neural Network Training Landscapes. And what they did was that they're analyzing random parametrized quantum circuits, where you just have some gates uh, that you do at random at each layer. And they just took some parameter in the circuit, and they were computing the variance of the partial derivative. And what they managed to show was that for deep circuits, that means whenever your depth is in poly n, then the variance is exponentially vanishing with the number of qubits. And why do we look at the variance? Because you're going to see that whenever people talk about barren plateaus, the variance always keeps appearing there. And it's because of Chebyshev's inequality. And this is just for the, mar for the math nerd, so I'm just going to leave this very small here. But it's essentially telling you that the probability of your cost function partial derivative to diverge from its, uh, from its mean value of zero. So that means that in average is going to be zero, but it can diverge from zero from a value C is upper bounded by the variance. So this means that if you have an exponentially vanishing variance, the probability of your cost function partial derivatives to not be zero is exponentially, uh, to be zero is exponentially, uh, sorry, of not be zero is exponentially suppressed. So in average, you're gonna have very small gradients and your landscape is going to be very, very flat. And this is what we call the barren plateau phenomenon. And of course, you can verify this empirically by just computing at the partial derivative of some parameters. You look at your cost function, and you just randomly sample angles for different number of qubits. And you can see this beautiful log plot where your variance is just becoming exponentially vanishing with the number of qubits. And here, uh, this spans from the fact that the circuit becomes a two design. And I'm going to get into this idea of two design in the next slide. But essentially, what it's telling you is that deep circuits are very expressive. And this is tuning in into, into Amira's stuff. She was talking about the expressibility or how much you can sample the Hilbert space. And it so happens that very deep random circuits 
are very expressible. You can actually just sample different parameters, and eventually you're going to sample all the unitaries that exist on n qubits. So that's what we call being uh, a two design. And we have a result a little bit more restringent, where we see that the more expressible your ansatz is going to be with this idea that I take a set of parameters, I put them into my parameterized quantum circuit, and I get sets of unitaries at the end, the more expressible my ansatz is, like we have here, the more likely it's going to have a barren plateau with this flat landscape in average. And here you can see that expressible ansatz might be good because they might contain this green region right here, which is the solution to problem A, but they might also con contain the solution to problem B. So in principle, expressible ansatz is something that we might want, but they have barren plateaus. Whereas non-expressible ansatz, like this one right here, that maybe it's not useful for problem B, but it is useful for problem A, they, they might still have uh, barren plateaus, but in general, maybe this is what we're trying to aim for because they're gonna be trainable. So the questions that we were asking are, how can we extend this barren plateau? What happens if we don't have deep circuits? What happens if we now have shallow circuits where they're not random enough or expressive enough so that they're just sampling all the unitaries available in, in the unitary space? So we actually showed that, yes, you can extend this barren plateau, and now it's going to depend on the locality of the cost function. And let me just give you this very simple toy model problem. Consider a circuit uh, of n qubits. In this case, it's 10 qubits. And I do a rotation around y on each one of the qubits. And the goal is for you to uh, learn the identity. So you want to start with the zero state, do some rotations, and return to the old zero state so that all of those rotations are the identity. Well, if you look at this very simply, you might tell me, yeah, but this is trivial, right? All the rotations have to be zero. If all the rotations are zero, I start with the zero state, I do identity, I end up with the zero state. Sure, but now I want you to solve this as you would in a, in a machine learning experiment. You're just gonna take this, you're just going to define a cost function. In this case, you might naively say, okay, I'm gonna define a cost function and I'm gonna call this global, and you're going to see why, as just what's the probability of starting with the zero state, applying the ansatz V, which is just a sensor product of rotations, and measure the probability of all the qubits being on zero. Evidently, if my state after I apply the unitary is zero, this cost function is going to be zero. If it's orthogonal, it's going to be one. So now this is a normalized cost function, and this is all really nice. Now, the problem with this cost function is that we're measuring all the qubits. And if we look at the landscape as we do here, which I'm just setting half of the angles to be theta one, half of the angles to be theta two, is that as I increase the number of qubits, you can see that the landscape starts to become flatter and flatter and flatter because we have a barren plateau phenomenon. And not only that, we have what we call a narrow gorge phenomenon, where you can see that the space that leads to small cost function values also shrinks exponentially with the system size. So this is telling you that even if you randomly initialize, you're not going to be able to hopefully end up inside of this well because the size of the well also becomes very small. And here, you know, this ansatz, it's not expressive, it's not random, it's not deep. So what's the problem here? Well, the problem is that the cost function is global. The problem is that you're trying to compare two states that live in exponentially large Hilbert spaces, and the information is encoded in their overlap. How close is my state to being to zero? And in average, that overlap is going to be exponentially small because Hilbert space is a very large space. So you might get this phenomenon where as you increase the number of qubits, you just have a barren plateau and a narrow gorge. But you might say, well, this is not the only cost function that I can define. I can also define a local cost function where instead of just looking at all the qubits in zero, I'm going to look at each one of the qubits individually on zero. And of course, if I look at each one of the qubits and they're all on zero, then I know that all of my state is also on zero. And this is a local cost function because instead of comparing objects globally by comparing objects that live in exponentially large Hilbert spaces, now I'm just looking at each qubit individually. And it turns out that local cost functions do not have barren plateaus. And, and this is what we call the cost function dependent barren plateau phenomena. And what we have now is essentially two sources of barren plateaus, the expressibility or the randomness induced barren plateaus and the globality induced barren plateaus. And you might be like, okay, so, so this is not looking too good, right? There's, there seems to be like, there's many things that lead to barren plateaus. And there's even more studies that have come 
out after hours, which are beautiful, of showing how entanglement can also induce brain plateaus, or, 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 or you know, or maybe you're looking at quantum neural network and and the globality of your perceptions uh, will also lead to brain plateaus. But of course, now we don't want to have brain plateaus. We want to try to avoid them. So let's say that you've just proposed your variational algorithm or your quantum neural network. How do you know? if it's going to have a brand plateau. And I'm going to give some series of things that you can do from, from the least realistic to the most realistic. So the first thing that you can do is you can just build a shrine for Preskill and pray that it doesn't have a brand plateau. Of course, this probably will not work, right? But you know, it's, it's, it's always good trying. But you can also try to, now going into more seriousness, you can try to plot the landscape and try to visualize this. But the problem is that this is very hard. How do you even plot the landscape? It's a hyperspace in many dimensions. I'm not even able to, to see something in four dimensions. How do I even look something in more dimensions? So this is hard to do. Something else that you can try to do to see if you have brown plateau, and this might be the first more realistic one, is you just randomly sample parameters and you study the scaling of your variance, just like the Google group did. And if you see a curve that is just linear in a log scale, then you might have a brown plateau. But of course, this is computationally demanding because you're going to have to simulate your quantum neural network for many qubits to be able to look at the trend. So then we come down to the nitty gritty, which is maybe you can perform a rigorous analysis of your quantum neural network and try to see if this, if this quantum neural network that you're trying to train is going to have a brown plateau or not. And this might be the best bet is going to be architecture dependent. So that means that the results that you get for one architecture might not be translatable to another architecture. So this is sort of what we were trying to do. And I'm going to share some results of different architectures that we studied to see if they have brown plateaus or not. So our first result is that we analyze this layered hardware efficient ansatz. So we've all heard about hardware efficient ansatz. We've all heard about this word ansatz. So here, let's just consider that we have a cost function that is just the trace of some Hermitian operator A. And I take some input state row and I send him through a parameterized unitary. And this unitary, whenever I see it in circuit form, is going to have this layered form where each time that I have a layer, I'm going to be acting with two qubit unitaries acting on alternating pairs of qubits to lead to this like brick-like structure. Now, this is an ansatz that you might have seen in many places in the literature. And what we showed is that for this type of ansatzes, whenever you have a global cost function, that means that O is acting non-trivially on all of your qubits, you're always going to have a barren plateau. It doesn't matter the depth of your circuit. And we can see this with our time model example. Even at depth one, with not even entangling gates, it already has a barren plateau. So, so this is not good, right? But on the other hand, whenever you look at local cost functions, uh, like ones where you're just measuring one or two qubits at the time, we have that we can provide some trainability guarantees. We know that there is some depth of your circuit where this is going to be trainable, and hence you're going to be able to, to optimize your cost function. So those type of trainability guarantees are very, very valuable because we have a complexity argument that is telling us if you have an ansatz of this form and you're in this regime, you're going to be able to train. And this is very valuable. If it's about, if on log n depth, uh, hardware efficient ansatz is expressible enough, that's another question. You might try to do some layer wise training or whatnot, but at least we have this trainability guarantee. So how do we have a trainability guarantee? Well, what we do is that we have a lower bound for this variance, because if now we have that the variance is lower bounded by something that vanishes at most polynomially with the number of qubits, that means that we're just going to need a polynomial number of shots to be able to determine uh, our cost function partial derivatives instead of an exponential number. Because again, if we have an exponential number of shots, then our algorithm has an exponential scaling because we're going to have to spend exponential time just running our circuit to be able to measure exponentially many times. And it cannot be better than any classical algorithm, right? Because it's exponentially scaling with the system dimension. So if we know that the variance is at most polynomially vanishing, great. We know that we're not going to have an exponential scaling coming from this trainability size. So the main message of this part is don't take for granted the trainability of your quantum neural network because you can train it in four or five or six qubits. It's not enough. You might want to do some more rigorous analysis to make sure that you're going to be able to train it and that your architecture, whenever someone tries to implement it in a 40, 50 qubit quantum computer, you're going to be actually able to train. So our results also show that there is this connection between locality and trainability. It's not just about expressiveness and trainability. The locality also matters here. And we have also this, this novel result of 
providing trainability guarantees in the form of lower bounds, as I was showing you. And of course, here I'm not going to get into the details, but there are some technical tools as to how our results are developed. Uh, there are some uh, there are some assumptions that go into our results. For instance, that each one of those gates uh, is for a minute two design. Uh, but you know, I don't want to get into the nitty gritty details. But uh, the thing is that those, those sort of results are going to be are going to be what we're trying to aim for to try to show that some architectures are trainable. So we've already gone a little bit about the bad and the ugly about variant plateaus, let's try to see the good. So the question is, can we employ those tools of rigorously analyzing uh, architectures to try to derive trainability for other quantum neural networks? And we've managed to do this. And more specifically, whenever we've looked at the quantum convolutional neural networks architecture that some people have already talked about them here in QHack. And what's interesting is that the results from the group Google group and the results from the hardware fission assets, we cannot apply them here because, again, there's a bunch of assumptions that go into deriving those results that do not apply here. So this is why we have to do an architecture dependent analysis. And when we did this, uh, and you know, just to state backward, because not everyone might know what a quantum convolutional uh, neural network is. So we know that classical neural networks are inspired by the structure of the visual cortex, and they're very used, and they're very much used for image recognition, for voice recognition, for everything that is pattern recognition. And the idea presented in uh, in, in this beautiful paper by Iris Kong et al is that we just generalize this architecture to quantum neural networks, where we take some quantum states and we just send them through this convolutional neural network that has a sequence of convolutional and pooled layers, that every time that we have a sequence of convolutional and pooling is going to reduce the number of qubits and hopefully preserve the information about the relevant data features, so that at the end we end up with a quantum state that lives in a much smaller Hilbert space. So once again, here we can define a cost function as just the summation of all of our states in our training data uh, and measure the expectation value of some operator at the end. And it's been shown that quantum convolutional neural networks can be applied to detect phase transitions and for quantum error correction. So being able to train them would be really nice. And what we showed, and again, I'm not going to go by any means into the details of this. But again, we have the variance, we have a lower bound, and we managed to show that under standard assumptions, this lower bound is going to be at most polynomially vanishing with the number of qubits. So, so we managed to show with this that the quantum convolutional neural network is an architecture that is perhaps generically trainable. And we don't have to go to some regime for it to be trainable. It's perhaps generically trainable, and we can always train the quantum convolutional neural network. So, you know, this might be something that is good because now we can inspire other architectures on QCNNs, or we can use QCNNs as, sub, uh, as some subroutines of our neural networks or of our bigger algorithm, because we know that at least for that part, we don't have to worry about their trainability. So what do we what do we show here? QCNNs, they might be generically turnable. They do not exhibit barren plateaus. And of course, as I said, there's still more, more work that remains to be done to understand the trainability of quantum neural networks and understand if they're going to be able to provide an advantage over classical neural networks. This proof is most likely going to be architecture specific. We have some results for some perceptron based quantum neural networks. And I've seen recently some results, again, like this entanglement induced variant plateaus that are not architecture specific, but they're making statements about, for instance, how much entanglement you're generating during your QNN. It doesn't really matter how you're generating it. So I think that those results are also very, very valuable because we can make statements that may be applicable to some art, to multiple architectures at a time. So, so, so that's, that's really interesting. And that's been something that I've been following very closely. And of course, the next step is we also have to analyze methods to mitigate or prevent effects of barren plateaus, like the so-called problem inspire ansatz, say, where we're embedding so much information into our ansatz that we're not exploring all the Hilbert space. Maybe we're just exploring a subset where we know our solution might be, and maybe problem inspire ansatzes will avoid barren plateaus we have evidence that some of them do, and we also have evidence that some of them don't. Stay tuned, we have some interesting results coming up. We also can think about other strategies like layer by layer training or smart initialization or correlating parameters. So, so this is also something that is going to be very interesting. If we cannot prevent our barren plateau, how do we circumvent it? How do we make sure to try to get the most 
out of our quantum neural network. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention. I hope that this was an interesting talk and please stay safe. Thank you so much, Marco, for that amazing talk. Uh, we've got lots of questions already coming in from the, the chat, so let's let's jump right into it. I really I really enjoyed this talk. I really like how you gave an overview of the phenomenon of barren plateaus, but there's a few questions that are kind of popping up in themes. So I'll try to I'll try to condense them so that you know multiple people's questions I can ask all at once. So sure. one theme I saw was um, you know, people were wondering. Is, is barren plateaus the only issue? What about poor local minimas? Is that also an issue? Do, you know, are there any, any other issues that you need to be aware of or is barren plateaus really the, the dominant one? It is by no means the dominant one. I would not say that if you don't have a barren plateau, everything is solved. Uh, we know some, we, we even have some complexity results about the number of local minimas in training variational algorithm landscapes. Barren plateau is just one of the issues that you might have. And the problem that we saw whenever we started working in Grand Plateaus was that there was this really beautiful paper, but it was sort of like standing there on its own. And, and so people were like, you know, you're not using deep pants, let's say, so maybe you're not really caring about this. So we just wanted to show that they're more general and you have to be careful about them, but they're by no means the only trainability issue that you have. Uh, for us, training the parameters means that you can go from one cost function value to one smaller cost function value. If you get stuck in a local minima, that's a whole different problem that, yeah, of course, it's, it's gonna need a lot of work to do for us to, to try to understand the nature of quantum and neural networks landscape, which I think is relatively obscure and we still don't know a lot. So, you know, it's, it's a thriving field. There's a lot of things to do. Great. For, for me, I always have this uh, sense that barren plateaus are just one of the, the dragons out there that, are, that await us. We're still so early on in quantum machine learning and variational circuits. We're just laying the groundwork right now. So it's really good that we're starting to make these first steps, but I think there's still a lot of things that we have to overcome to get where we want to go. Exactly. Yeah. And and interestingly enough, because you mentioned that barren plateau is one of the issues, uh, Patrick hinted at this, but you have barren plateaus that arise because you have noise in your system. And those are maybe more interesting that I already talked about expressibility and locality in those barren plateaus. The noise in those barren plateaus might be a little bit more dangerous because, first of all, they're architecture independent. It doesn't matter if your ANSAT says it's problem inspired or problem agnostic, like a hardware efficient ANSAT. If you have long enough depth, your whole cost function landscape is going to get flattened because of noise and you're not going to be able to train. So, so maybe some of the tools that we learned from one of the brand plateaus are going to be useful in another. So, you know, uh, again, I agree that it's not the only, but it seems like it's a, whenever, you, wherever you look, you might be finding a brand plateau. Yeah. You mentioned uh, as well, the QCNN is a particular architecture. You said, you know, the, the issue of whether you encounter barren plateaus is really going to be tied to your ANSATs that you're choosing. And the QCNN is a nice candidate because it's got this tensor network-like structure that is somehow compressing information. But there was a question in the chat. Um, is it actually the case that this QCNN looks a little bit like Mera uh, and so potentially is classically simulatable? So um, yeah, QCNN is essentially a Mera in reverse. But it's not going to be classically simulable because in Mera, if you think about Mera, what you do is that you start here with zero. And in, every time that you see a measurement, just input a qubit on zero. And instead of a unitary, you might do a more general uh, isomorphism. So the thing here is that this is simulable because you have this light cone structure that, that sort of preserves and has a constant width. With the quantum convolutional neural network, the whole problem is that it all depends on what your input state is. If your input state is entangled, you're not going to be able to simulate this whole architecture. Sure, if your input state is all zero state, you might be able to, to simulate the QCNN, but you know, I don't foresee anyone using QCNN to classify uh, bit strings. So, so it's not going to be classically simple because of this row in. And, and that's maybe the key difference uh, of using Mera in reverse, wherever you are applying this gate architecture to an input state, is that to simulate the whole architecture, you have to simulate row in. So if row in is not classically simulable, you might not simulate QCNN. Great, that's, that's really interesting. We have um, a couple of people who asked about intuition behind barren plateaus. Like, is it generated by entanglement? Is there some geometric intuition from the quantum parameter space in high dimensions? Do you have a favorite way that you like to think about why barren plateaus should appear generically? I know that there's Levy's lemma, which is basically a statement about 
things that happen in high dimensional vector spaces, but that's probably unsatisfying to most people. So is there, is there some sort of like basic intuition you could say like this is this is the fundamental thinking you should have? So uh, it depends what type of parent factor you're looking at. So Levy's lemma is only useful whenever, and Levy's lemma is sort of about the same idea of entanglement in this parent plateau. So now think about this problem. You have a state on a bunch of qubits. Uh, maybe you have n qubits and you do a big random unitary on those n qubits. And then you're just measuring, say, n sub a, a subsystem. Levy's lemma is telling you is, is that uh, the larger the number of qubits, whenever you trace out all those qubits because you just want to measure Na, with very high probability, you have this concentration of measure where your state is going to be very close to being maximum limit. So it's going to be hard to extract information from it. So, so, so this is sort of the intuition behind Levitt's lemma. But this is not always true. For instance, for the cost function dependent Baron Plateau phenomena, uh, you don't have this problem of concentration of measure or or Levy's lemma. What you have here is this notion of what I was saying. You're trying to extract information from the overlap between one quantum state in your Hilbert space and the old zero state. And if you think about this quantum state, if I randomly initialize all the angles, it's going to have component on all the elements uh, of, of the computational basis. So the element of zero, the one where I'm trying to extract information, is going to have an amplitude that is exponentially small because my state is normalized. So trying to extract information from that exponentially small signal is hard. So, so that's what I'm saying. Like it really depends on what type of brown photo phenomena you're looking at, but the intuition of concentration of measure and Levy's lemma and entanglement induced brown plateaus, they sort of all fall into one category, whereas the locality falls in a different category, which is this, you know, Hilbert space is a very large space. And you're trying to extract information from an exponentially small signal, if you will. So Hilbert space is a very large place. It's a great way to summarize it. Yeah. Cool. I, I see. I saw a few questions in the chat, and this is actually good because I had uh, similar questions for you. So I spent a lot of time in a you know previous career reading deep learning papers, and I remember that they went through something very very similar with this so-called vanishing gradient property. So you know a neural network is ostensibly not quite the same thing as a quantum circuit, but they still had the issue where their models had gradients that were disappearing. They had a different name for it. Um, can you comment on how similar and, and how different the quantum and classical cases are for, for these disappearing or vanishing gradients? So in classical machine learning, your vanishing gradients arise whenever you have deep quantum neural networks and you have a lot of parameters that you have to train. And, uh, and this is more closely related, if you will, with the expressibility variant plateaus whenever I have deep random circuits in the sense that the signal that I changed this small parameter at the beginning of the circuit, and it's just gonna get scrambled throughout the rest of the circuit because it's very deep. Uh, that's sort of about the same. Uh, whenever we talk about noise-induced variant plateaus or locality-induced variant plateaus, those are not as obvious if they're going to be the same thing as the vanishing gradients in classical machine learning, because those only arise for deep neural networks. So, so there are some parallels, but in some sense, uh, and I might say uh, a little bit of a controversial statement, some of the, of the phenomena that we get from Byron plateaus is coming from the quantum nature of our quantum neural network. It's not necessarily the same like the locality one. So, so for me, at least personally, there is a difference between the two in which uh, you can sort of see some of the Byron plateau phenomena arising in quantum neural networks as purely quantum phenomena. Cool. So there is there is still some some quantum element to when we're seeing it. something that ostensibly sounds very similar to the classical case. Yes. So I, I, in, on the same vein, uh, I know that when they had this barren plateau, well, they called it the vanishing gradient problem. When they had the vanishing gradient problem in deep learning, there was a number of different potential solutions that were proposed. So in the early days, there were things like uh, layer-wise pre-training or, or pruning or uh, making very smart choices of initialization. And now they use things like batch norm or they have just, you know, ReLU, uh, not ReLU, um, ResNets that are basically designed not to have vanishing gradients and all, all of these tricks that they developed. I'm starting to see some of those tricks being ported to quantum. So I've definitely seen people use the pre-training strategy. I've definitely seen people use the initial initialization strategy. Do you think that there's, there's still some more uh, tools that we can develop in the quantum case to push us towards a, a situation where these burn plateaus don't appear anymore? So there's definitely a lot of work to be done because the thing about some of those methods that you mentioned, like the initialization strategies or layer by layer training, uh, 
they all seem to work in some cases, but they don't work in other cases, which is unfortunate because we've had papers saying, oh, this is a good technique. But then there's another paper a couple of months later that says, you know, it's good, but it has these problems, so it might not be great. And you see that they're looking at uh, perhaps different problems. So the question is, do we have a general strategy to prevent or mitigate brand plateaus? I don't really think so. Probably today, the best strategy is just try to use problem inspired hunts, let's say. Uh, but, but as Patrick was saying, those have the problems that they're usually very deep or you have to have a lot of knowledge about your problem. And I actually had some uh, some implementation of a quantum autoencoder here that we have in our paper where you can't really use a problem inspired assets because the goal is just take a quantum state and compress it. If you don't know anything about that quantum state, you cannot build a problem inspired asset. So, you know, harder efficient assets is just your best guess. So not all problems can happen problem inspired answer say so that's another issue so there's definitely a lot of work to be done i don't think that we have uh, you know the killer app that this is the way to prevent brand plateaus uh, definitely if you can use problem inspired answer say use them mm -hmm. so how far would you say in time are we before we're at the level where these are the kind of things that are just uh, remnants of a forgotten era like we've got the tools they're built into every software framework they're built into every theorist toolkit where the barren plateau phenomenon just doesn't come about by construction. Uh, can you repeat the question? I, I understood the last part, but what was the question specifically about those tools? How, how far do you think we have to go before we're at that stage where we don't have to worry about barren plateaus, or is it always going to be hanging around? I think that uh, we might have some tools for some architectures. Uh, for instance, if you're trying to do VQE on a fermionic uh, Hamiltonians, you might know which is the best transformation that you have to do when what's the best way of use your of using your UCC ansatz. But the problem is that as Patrick was saying during his talk, variational algorithms and quantum neural networks, they're they're task oriented. So whenever you come up with a new algorithm, you know, maybe some of the tools that were useful for other methods might not be useful here. And you're you're gonna have to come up with new methods to avoid uh, the trainability issues that arise there. Um, so in for Baron Plateau specifically, hopefully we can get uh, some general results, but they're going to be very architecture specific. Uh, that's that's the main problem that I see for for general tools. Definitely for some applications, we're going to come up with with tools that are going to help, and maybe those are going to be general generalizable, but not really sure how much they're going to be able to to be useful for all implementations. Cool. So that sounds uh, that sounds a bit like a pessimistic take to me. There's still lots of work ahead of us. Yeah, for me, it's not pessimistic. It just means that we're starting to understand the problem. Uh, I think that, you know, QNN and QML are just very, very young fields uh, in, spite of, in spite of everything and all the work that has been done. There's still many questions to be addressed. And uh, perhaps we can find ways to just prevent barren plateaus at all. Uh, you know, um, for instance, there, there's a question like whether whenever you're doing QML with kernel methods, do they have barren plateaus? Or maybe there's just like different approaches that we can take. Uh, I, I don't know. I think I think it's just raising the question that we still need to understand the problems better, and that for me is very interesting because it means that there's so many problems to to tackle. Yeah, I agree. It's it's a kind of an exciting stage. If you run out of problems to to solve, then you know it's not as interesting. It's great to know that there's all these challenges to overcome still. Right. So I, I see someone posting this a couple of times. So I'll quickly make sure it gets asked. Does QAOA have a barren plateau issue? <laughs> so you remember when I said we have problem inspired ansatz say uh, they appear to not have barren plateaus. So QAOA is a problem inspired ansatz say QAOA vanilla QAOA for you know max cut problems uh, it does not seem to have a barren plateau. In fact, uh, it's not uniformly sampling over over the whole theory space. We know that it does whenever you go to infinite layers because we know that QAOA is computationally universal, but you don't really go to that many. Uh, we uh, we're we're gonna put out real soon a paper where we show that some problem inspired ansatz say uh, have barren plateaus uh, and some of them are QAOA based, but you know uh, QAOA vanilla does not seem to have barren plateau, but it, it just seems to be like a lucky coincidence. You, hopefully, you'll get to read about that very soon. Definitely, we'll watch out for that. Sounds exciting. So, we're just one final technical question, and then uh, we can. We can go to a little personal interview. Uh, I saw this in the chat, and I also had the question myself. 
what happens if you use a different optimization strategy that's not based on gradients or that takes into account the quantum geometry somehow? Can that avoid this barren plateaus issue? So we we were that's a question that got asked to us a lot by referees, which is, you know, you're talking about so much about gradients. What happens if you do gradient based gradient free optimization methods? Maybe they're gonna not see barren plateaus. But if you think about it, now picture a flat landscape. What is a gradient-free method, like an LME method that you're just trying to build a simplex? Imagine putting a triangle in, in, in your cost function landscape, computing the cost function value at each one of the vertices of that triangle, and taking the one that is smallest and knowing that that's the direction that you should go towards. So you're essentially comparing cost function values at different points in your cost function landscape. And we have another paper with another postdoc and Patrick here, uh, Andrew Arasmith is the other postdoc, big shout outs too. And we showed that if you have a barren plateau, from the perspective of gradients, you're also going to have a hard time telling apart cost function values because they're exponentially close, right? So whenever you visualize the landscape, you realize that one implies the other. So, so gradient-free methods are also going to be a pro, uh, going to be hit by this. So trying to to look at some of the elements of the of the metric tensor, you might require an exponentially large precision to determine them. So training inside of a barren plateau, it doesn't seem to be that gradient-free or gradient-based method work, maybe the best approach is to try to avoid the barren plateau altogether. But if you have a barren plateau already, it's it, there, I, don't, I don't know of any way that you can train off gradient-free or gradient-based. Hey, I must say, I, I approve of this answer. I somehow always have the impression that these gradient-free methods are just avoiding information that's, you know, that's available. And maybe that's expensive to compute, so you want to avoid it, but it's somehow, if I'm sitting on top of a mountain, you know, I might as well look around and see which way is the easiest one to go rather than just stumbling down the hill randomly. Yeah, yeah. And and again, because if you stand at top of the mountain and you're able to see differences in levels, you're good, right? You just compare levels. But if you're standing inside of, on top of a mesa and everything looks the same, uh, you're not looking at how steep the land is. You're just looking around you to try to compare levels. And if everything looks the same, you're not going to be able to know which direction to go. So yeah, I agree. Great. You mentioned mesas and... Uh... I know you had some pictures in your talk there as well. Um, Patrick Coles mentioned yesterday that the I don't know, kind of hiking, the, the landscape around Los Alamos is, is really nice. Do you ever get out and you know, are there barren plateaus or are there shallow minima in Los Alamos? <laughs> So we have a little bit of everything. New Mexico is a very beautiful place. Uh, it's a little bit unfortunate that uh, last year Quantum Summer School was uh, was virtual because two years before that we we did go into hiking that Patrick was organizing with some of the students. We have a lot of beautiful places around here, and uh, yeah, it's full of mountains. It's a small mountain town, Los Alamos. Very beautiful. Hope you all get to visit at some point. Give a talk about your work. We'd be happy to to have you here. Great. I, I mean, I, I know it, uh, it's still very successful when you have your summer school, even virtually, but I'm sure those students would love to experience it being in Los Alamos itself. I'm sure it's an incredible location. It, so, it is good. So, so Marco, you, you were one of the, the diehards who was uh, chatting with us last night in the After Hours stream, and we got to chatting a little bit, and uh, your, your Twitch username is MarcoDND. And I know it says on your Twitter handle, it says Master of Dungeons. And so I got called out on it yesterday for the, the books on my shelf here. So I'm going to I'm gonna call you out on it as well. Can you tell us a little bit about your uh, your obsession? Yeah, no. I, I also, whenever whenever you were uh, discussing, I was like, those are Dungeons & Dragons books back there. I mean, I could tell them apart like a mile away. Yeah, I've been playing Dungeons & Dragons for about seven years, pretty hardcore now. I was playing more sparsely before that and you know for me it's a great way to use imagination and use creative creativity in, in a way that is not just science related you know science it's a lot of creativity and a lot of uh, being thinking about cool ways of solving problems so for me dungeons and dragons is, is a way to just take that inspiration and that imagination and just put it to collective storytelling so I really enjoy being together with people, just telling a story together. You know, I even have a Dungeons and Dragons tattoo. I don't know if you get to see it here, but there's a guy with a dragon and a D20. Yeah, so pretty, pretty hardcore fan. Yeah, I have a shameful amount of Dungeons and Dragons paraphernalia laying around my house. Wow. And, and do you ever, uh, on Twitch, do you ever live stream your games? Have you ever, have you ever follow up? 
So I still haven't gotten to, to that point because um, I play with my group. <laughs> I don't think, I think we'd be banned from Twitch really fast <laughs> if we were to stream our, our games. Uh, it's a pretty large group. I DM for a group of eight, which is never advised, but, it's so fun. Fun. but you know, yeah, I, I don't think Twitch would allow us to stream it, even if we wanted to. Awesome. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the, the summer school? Uh, how, do, how do people get involved? If people want to find out about the summer school or they want to take part this year, they want to apply, how do they get that first step to get in touch with you? So the summer school, uh, I think this year is going to be the fourth. Please don't kill me, Patrick and Lucas, if I'm saying this wrong. I think this is correct. So recently, submissions are usually from December to January, if I'm not wrong. So this year, they're already closed. I believe that some of the students, uh, I'm, I think we're in the process of selecting the students. And uh, I would say, stay tuned to the announcements that we make over social media. You can always check the, the Quantum Summer School website. We also advertise them through Twitter, through Facebook. You know, This is something that Armio was saying, like using social media as a, as an, as a place to get in touch with other scientists. I, I really advise this to people. You know, I came here, first thing that Patrick told me was like, you got to get on Twitter. There's Quantum Twitter. Everyone is in there. I was a little bit reluctant. I'm so happy I did it because it's not just about self-promotion. It's about staying in touch with people, seeing what people are doing, getting into interesting discussions. So I see this more as a, as a fun work tool. So definitely we post about the summer school uh, on Twitter. And, uh, and we're very excited about this year's summer school. Uh, we, we've been slowly growing it, and hopefully we're going to get some interesting papers out of it. It's always really nice in the fall to see that uh, steady stream of papers coming out of the summer school. Yeah, it's it's always a lot of work. Once the fall gets and we're wrapping up projects, it's, it's crazy work, but crazy fun. We've, we've had some great students here. Uh, definitely keep track of, of the students that we've been working with. I think they're all promising young minds that are going to take the field by storm. So keep an eye out for them. Awesome. So Marco, we have to wrap up in about a minute or two, but I wanted to just quickly play a, a little mini game here with you. And, and we did this yesterday as well. Well, my colleague Juan Miguel did it. It's, it's just going to be a series of rapid fire questions. And you have, you have to tell me the thing that comes to your mind first. Don't, don't, over, don't overthink it. Just give me the first thing that comes to your mind. Sure. You ready? Dangerous, but sure. You ready? Sure. All right. Favorite quantum algorithm? VQE. Uh, Favorite board game? Dungeons and Dragons by far. Favorite scientist? Uh, Einstein. Nice. Favorite D&D &D class? Uh, cleric. Everyone loves a healer. No one likes to play it, but it's the best. Welcome in any party, for sure. Yeah. Favorite equation? Uh, dear X equation. It's beautiful. Nice. Your favorite non-main Smash Brothers character? Cheeklypuff. No, you're, you're not, <laughs> oh, you're not main. Main. That's my main. Uh, the non-main Mario. It's great. Mario. Nice. Favorite periodic table element? Uh, helium. I always liked that. It was up there alone. All right. And last question. Favorite Star Wars character? Oh, still get me started about Star Wars. I'm a big Star Wars fan. Don't nothing coming out of the latest trilogy. Please don't. They never existed. I refuse to acknowledge them. Uh, that the answer my, here is Chewbacca. My favorite uh, Mace Windu. Mace Windu. Nice. All right, Marco, it's been real fun to chat with you today. And I hope everyone in the chat enjoyed it as well. We will be back with you soon in a few minutes with our next speaker. Yeah, thank you very much for hosting me. It was fun.